Welcome to Game Time Live. Chris Miles here with the shooter and the coach. We always got it. What do we do? Leave we leave it. it. There you go. I thought that was me, the shooter. You no, know, you can shoot right back in the day. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> you know how to coach to shoot. I couldn't. I could defend, though. Yes, you could. <laughs> As we've had a number of incredible performances already this Sunday, a monster double-double, a double overtime game, and two 40-point scores. We're not even counting the bearded one in that equation yet. Bradley Beal and Kawhi Leonard, those two guys who were talking about having a great Sunday afternoon. Well, it's fun to see when one player, you know, takes over. I'm talking about Bradley Beal because, you know, John Wall's being down. But you see Siakam now getting the big steals. Like, Toronto as a whole coach all season long has really stepped up and let people know that we're for real. So tonight on the road, they showed again. This is one of the deepest teams, if not the deepest team, in the NBA. So to see them come out, and it seems like each night a different guy steps up for them. Well, Toronto with a big lead in the fourth quarter. You see it 111 to 99. And back come the Wizards. Trevor Reza back with the team. 23 points, nine rebounds, 10 assists, just missed a triple-double. Bradley Beal did have a triple-double, pulled up from long range. Beal, 21 points in the fourth quarter. Wizards down by seven, make that's, that. That's huge right there. Mm -hmm. That's just huge from an all-star making a big-time play in the fourth quarter. Connects again, and we have a two-point game after Wizards were getting blown out in the fourth. Bradley Beal feeling it. Kawhi Leonard trying to put the game on ice. And it looks, you know, five-point lead, Toronto up with a minute to go. You think it's over, right? Not so fast. Otto Porter. Uh, leave this, it. That, that looks like a make, but uh, it's not 3D. Huh, leave it this time, leave it. There yeah, we go. Yeah, that one dropped. There we go. And we're tied at 124. The comeback, well, sort of complete because we sent it to overtime. Kawhi Leonard, you can't let him rock you to sleep with that extra dribble. 41 points for Kawhi, 11 rebounds, 5 assists. Bradley Beal again, tying the game up at 131. Putting the ball on the floor, attacking the defense, Bradley Beal there in the overtime. And then Beal creating for Thomas Bryant, 15 assists for Beal, ties his career high that he set just over a month ago. And then down the stretch, anytime Toronto, coach, to your point, Ibaka, who got the big rebound for the extra shot? The veteran. So Toronto with a two-point lead, 2.8 seconds to go in the second overtime, and the deep pass is intercepted. The Wizards fall 140 to 138. Bradley Beal played 55 minutes to get those 43 points. Go along with the 10 rebounds and the 15 assists. Well, Washington is shooting 43% from the three-point line. Good night from the uh, deep area. Yes, indeed. It's going to be a marquee matchup right there. Here is Serge Ibaka after the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is NBA, man. You know, I know. And uh, when you relax like we did in the second half, you know, team's going to come back, you know, because, you know, we start, we start so early getting easy bucket and uh, we kind of relax. You know, but they didn't give up. You know, you have to give them a lot of credit because uh, sometimes, you know, when you know teams down like that, they always give up. But you know, they was keeping fighting, fighting, and then that's why we had a close game. Yeah, you know, Kawhi is a tough guy. You know, and uh, he 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 had he was in great, great position under the basket and the ball, you know, to grab the rebound. Also, because I was spacing, you know, to let him play one on one. That's why I had I had that open twist. I think tonight he played like a superstar. You know, that's that's how we need him to play. You know, he did his job. That's that's his job as a superstar. You know, where we need him to step up and uh, make big play like he did tonight. Wasn't one of the complaints with Washington that they didn't share the basketball, they didn't move the basketball, and suddenly, 36 assists in a game tonight for the Wizards. That's a special number. Yeah, they've been averaging over 30 assists in the game since uh, John Wall has been out. But, I mean, Bradley Beal, a big part of that. This is the second time in the last month we've seen him get 15 assists. I mean, there's one thing for him to have a 40-point triple-double, triple-overtime game against the Phoenix Suns. It's another thing for him to do it, 3D, against a team like the Raptors with the Wizards down in the fourth quarter. Are the Wizards restoring your faith that they could actually be a playoff team this year? When you see a game like this, I know there's no moral victories, but to see how they fought against the team with the most wins in the NBA. If you're a Wizards fan, Chris, to your question, 
you saw some fight tonight you hadn't seen in a while. And also to Coach's point with the 36 assists, it kind of feeds off with last year's, you know, Monica where coach, when every time John Wall wasn't playing, they said more, we all eat more. Well, 36 assists proves that we all eat. So the question is now, Chris, can you bring this fight you showed us tonight all the way up to the All-Star break to, to your question, kind of believe that maybe we can fight for a spot. And that's the thing for me, Coach, that don't let this be a one-game stand where you get down by 25 points, your local crowd starts booing you first, and then you get back in the ball game, you find some energy, and then you make a game of it in double overtime. Hasn't it seemed like Washington's had a horrendous season up to this point? Mm -hmm. But when you look at the standings, they're two games out of the eighth spot for the playoffs, which so either means – the East is really bad, okay, or they've kind of been deceiving, just hanging around long enough to maybe make a move in the second half of the season. Well, I think to this conversation, Coach, you can say one through five, those teams we kind of believe, you know, they're going to be solid. Maybe before Dragic went down for the Heat, you probably would give them a, a little more, you know, solid playoff push. But six down to ten, it's been fluctuating all season long, to your point. So now John Wall goes down, and then they start playing better basketball. But wait a minute, he's your franchise player. So now, you know, from being up in D.C., a lot of the conversation is, well, wait a minute, John Wall's done for the season. This team is playing better. Now, do we make a move for the, for the trade deadline and maybe shore up our front line and make our rebound a little bit better and maybe hold on to that A spot? Well, who's, who's the move? Uh, that's what I'm saying. Who would the move be? Uh, I don't know. Because somebody's got an awful big contract there. I mean, <laughs> I mean like, really big contract. I mean, really big. Yeah, really big. <laughs> I, I believe you're talking about John Wall. Who well, no. Well, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, let's focus on the team with the most wins in the NBA right now. The Toronto Raptors, seeing how they were able to. Again, we talked about the Wizards fighting. The Raptors could have easily been like, okay, this is a game where they have the energy. They take the win. Raptors continue to lead the league. In wins, their only loss since the start of the new year against the San Antonio Spurs. We know that was an emotional game for them with Kawhi Leonard yes. going back down there. When you look at this Toronto team, do you see them as being the favorites coming out of the East to go to the NBA Finals? Not just winning the regular season, but going to the Finals. Well, Toronto, along with Milwaukee right now, are the two best teams in the yep. Eastern Conference. And well, let's face it, everybody was expecting Boston to come out and have a sensational beginning of the season, beginning of, the, you know, the uh, regular season. But unfortunately, this is not the same Boston team that finished up at the end of last year. You have two guys that came back that weren't there at the end, Kyrie and Haywood. And the chemistry and the same fire was isn't there right now that was there at the end of last season during the playoffs during that great matchup against the Cavaliers. So, you know, the question is why – Sometimes chemistry is hard to attain. It takes time mm -hmm. for everybody to fit and want the same thing. And with that being said, that's why I would say Toronto yesterday because of that chemistry. Because everyone wondered when you bring in Kawhi Leonard, how are we going to keep this young man happy? Not playing back-to-back. -back. So I think Nick Nurse along with Masai Ujiri is doing all the right things and pulling all the right buttons to keep this chemistry on the right page. So now you look at Siakam, all those Van Fleets of the world, they've all improved over the year. Now that's what makes that bench deeper. C.J. Miles still hadn't shot the ball particularly well. We know how he can stretch the defense. So they're deep enough, Coach, and they still have Danny Green and Kawhi Leonard who were what? Championship tested. Yeah, well, what about Indiana? We need to mention them because Indiana, yep. when they finished yep. up last season – Everybody was saying, wow, this team, you know, watch out for them next year. But Oladipo hasn't gotten back yet to that level that he was playing at during the, the playoffs last year. And a certain guy named Paul George was important to that team last year. So even though they're good, they're solid, uh, I mean, this is a, a tough out to knock these guys out. Still may, may not be the same Indiana team that we saw last year. And you have to also mention the Philadelphia 76ers, who are a team that you see the young talent, you see the possibility for some ascension. They were in action. Oh, we have a full week of games, including tonight's Spurs and Thunder rematch. Sunday night, we have a finals rematch of sorts. LeBron James' current team will face his former team. Lakers host the Cavs. LeBron's still out uh, with that injury. Tuesday, it's a doubleheader featuring the Lakers again as a nightcap. Pay close attention to Thursday afternoon. 3 o'clock game from London between the Wizards and the Knicks. And that will conclude a busy week of games right here on NBA TV. So we've officially passed the halfway point of the regular season. There's a line of demarcation in the top five teams in the Eastern Conference. We seem to know who they are heading towards the postseason. Unless there's a collapse, those five teams will be in. So your 6 through 11 teams all hovering around 500, taking a look at those teams you see right there, 
Hmm. Let's start with the Miami Heat because they seem to be in most control of their destiny. Justice Winslow now running the offense, 9-4 and four in their last 13 games. Brennan, why is that working so well for them, having Justice run that offense? Well, I, I think they really, they really have a diversified portfolio in their game anyway. They don't really have a true point guard. They have multiple guards out there, most, multiple guys that can handle the ball. Justice gives them a defensive toughness, a tenacity, and he's improved his jump shot tremendously from when he first came out. So I think it works for their team, but they're basically just getting their best guys out there, their athletic guys, and they're letting them all go out there and play and have an impact on the game. Griff, when we look at the Brooklyn Nets, that seems like a miraculous accomplishment by the front office, okay? Because they're competitive now. Karis LeVert emerges as one of their best players. He goes down and they just seem to respond by winning more games, winning 13 of their last 18. Can we assume that they're going to be in the mix in the playoffs as well? It's interesting. I think they're one of the teams that has to decide if they're a seller or a buyer. Mm. And when I look at their circumstance, I, I think you probably call them a team that's still trying to accumulate assets. They're going to keep trying to add picks. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Sean Marks and Trajan Langdon look at potentially moving somebody along the lines of Joe Harris, by way of example, who's on a tremendously team-friendly contract. He's shooting 48.5% from three. They can't, move my, they can't move our guy Joe, Griff. That's yeah. our guy. Well, I understand. And, and the thing for me is they actually made it possible for Joe to become Joe in large part because Kenny Atkinson has built the environment that he has there. They are a team that tells each other what they need to hear. They have very high uh, accountability standards there. And guys play both sides of the floor with equal passion. And so Joe has gotten an opportunity to really thrive there. But I also think that if you're in the situation they're in, adding picks would be really sig significant for them. And while they could probably make a playoff run and a playoff push, they may not think they can do damage in the playoffs. And maybe you push things down the road one more year. It's a possibility. Do you think that the young guys would benefit, though, from being in the playoffs and getting that experience, though? I, I do think there's value in that. But I also think if you get into the first round of the playoffs and it's a mismatch when you're there, they only get so much out of that. And the long-term benefit of getting additional picks that you can build around, probably greater. Now, the counter-argument to this is, look, Joe Harris is there for next year. If they're going to try to be good next year and be a playoff team, how do you live without a guy that shoots quite like that? And I could hear that argument as well. Well, taking a trip out west, when we look at the Utah Jazz, that's a team that we just all assumed would take a leap this season. And early in the, in the year, they seem to take a step back. Now they seem to be making that leap as far as Donovan Mitchell finding his stride. Last year, they got Rudy Gobert back to make their playoff push. This year, that, that wasn't the case. They were healthy and still struggled early on. What do you see from them now that's, that's got them back on the winning track? Well, ironically, I think one of the things that happened is they've had so many injuries to their point guards, they've needed Donovan Mitchell to be more ball dominant, and they've needed him to value possessions more. I think Donovan was really struggling early on with the quality of shots he was taking. His decision making was lacking a little bit, and I think what you've seen in the absence of the other available playmakers, he's sort of taken the onus to be a little bit more mindful of quality of shot, getting other people involved. And certainly the number one issue is they've committed themselves to the defensive side of the floor at the same rate they did last year. They were all about overachieving at one point last year, and they came into this season maybe thinking they were better than they were. They're a young team. They're not used to taking people's best shots. But the schedule gets a lot easier from here on out from them, and you should see them be able to make some strides. Yeah, and another thing is that Rudy Gobert has played very strong for them as well. Um, he's continued to be beastly on the boards. He has been big inside. He has been eating the glass 13 rebounds per game on the season. And when you have a big man in that like that that's giving you those extra possessions, um, he's able to uh, block shots at the rim. He's able to control the paint on both ends, and that has a value for a team like Utah that's, you know, they're not the most talented up and down team in the world. So a guy that can, when you slow it down, a guy that can have an uh, impact defensively and then give you extra possessions on the other end, he's key for you. Also, he closes out possessions with great defensive rebounding. I also think one of the things that happened to them early in the year is the new defensive rules took 
a big impact on them. It had a big impact on them and took a little while for them to figure out how to adjust to it because both Joe Ingles and Jay Crowder can be very good defensively, but they were doing it with a little bit of physicality at one point. So they had to adjust to that. And when you also don't have ball dominant play creators, like a lot of the better teams in the Western conference, if that's going to be something that's at a premium because the officials are letting you drive now right. with, almost impunity, not having another driver is a big issue as well. Well, certainly the Houston Rockets have a guy driving that team and James Harden and what he's accomplishing. As you see, the Rockets just skyrocketing up the standings. But then we also look at the Sacramento Kings, right? They started off red hot, three and six in their last nine. That backcourt dynamic at times with De'Aaron Fox and Buddy Hill. But do you think they're, they're still a season away from being a team you can see in the postseason and, and able to try to contend to at least win around? Certainly win around, I think that's true. I, I think it's interesting the two teams you just mentioned, Houston and Sacramento, one after the other, because you've got teams that are trying to play the complete opposite style of ball. Sacramento wants to force tempo as often as they can, and what happens in a circumstance like that, particularly with a young team, is you will be a very high turnover team. You will be somewhat mistake prone. The Aaron Fox has been special good to this point. I think as he continues to grow and evolve, the expectation that team should have of itself will grow as well, because he is a guy who can take them a very long way. But again, they may have been a year ahead of themselves. Yeah, I think this team is a year away. I think this backcourt is very good. They do have the outside chance to maybe sneak into the playoffs and maybe grab that eighth seed or the seventh seed. But a young backcourt like this is still going to take some time. There's still going to be some things that they're going to need to learn, some, uh, some bumps in the road that they're going to go through. And I think they're going to be, be better for it. But in the short term, they're probably not going to make the playoffs. They, I definitely don't see them winning around because if you're the eighth seed or the seventh seed, there's a strong chance you run into a team like Denver or Golden State. That probably wouldn't be good for Sacramento at this time. But – Sacramento fans, they, they say it's per, all purple talk out there, whatever. Listen, the future is very bright. This backcourt is dynamic. And in a couple of years, when we see other backcourts slow down, we might be saying this is the backcourt of the future. They definitely have next. So looking at the, the bottom half of the Western Conference, trying to make that playoff push of the teams you see there, who do you think will end up eventually into the postseason? And who do you think will be home thinking, hmm, we were close but no cigar? Well, two of the teams that are outside the playoffs and just outside the playoffs right now that stand out to me, Utah, despite all the injuries that they have. Absolutely. Because they have the easiest schedule against the rest of the way in the entire league, which is hard to do in the Western Conference. Their opponents have a 48% winning percentage the rest of the way. That's a much easier road than, to hoe than some of the teams that are above them. And then I look at New Orleans. And both of these teams have the best scoring differential of the teams that are just on the outside of the playoffs. And I think those are teams that are very likely to make a run. And depending on what happens with the Lakers and LeBron James, the length of his injury and his absence will have a great deal to say about who makes the playoffs and who doesn't. Right. Certainly something we're going to have to keep an eye out on the uh, West Coast trying to figure out, okay, what team still has the goods, what team does not. And when you look at Sacramento coming into this season, they've already overachieved, right? They've already gone to a place we didn't know that they would be. When you look at their roster overall and you look at the backcourt, you think that's solidified and they have a young player in Marvin Bagley and another guy that are developing in Harry Giles. What do you think their, their biggest need is as far as what they're going to try to do in the offseason in, in position they can grow uh, fastest and most? Well, I think one of the things you've seen when they've talked about potential trades for Sacramento, and they've been linked to Ennis Cantor by way of example. I think they're looking for a big who can score in the paint. I think they're looking for somebody that they can believe in at the five a little bit more offensively than Willie Cauley-Stein. At the same time, I'm not exactly sure that's the direction I would go if I was them. Because the defensive component is so important, the rim protection component is so important, Ennis Cantor is not a defensive player in any way. And a team that wants to play that fast, giving up that many possessions, playing with fives that aren't going to protect the rim would scare me quite a bit. So I understand that they want some interior presence, but I think they may be better off just letting it grow together with the young kids. Right.